sometimes I wonder if I'm uh, too firm with uh, dogs that I know and I'm comfortable comfortable with. For example, um, my girlfriend's dog, Abby, she's a small moose, um, 100 pounds of stupid. Love, love the idiot so much. Yeah, she was a rescue and like she's come such a long, like she's such a good dog. I have a pretty firm hand with her, like I don't let her get away with a lot just to keep her on track. Because if you're stupid, then you need that. And that doesn't, it's not restricted to dogs. I digress. Um, sometimes I feel really bad when I'm here at Brad's place because Brad has two dogs, Ollie who's a boxer and Demon who's a um, husky and a, a German Shepherd mix. Golden Retriever. Gold, husky and Golden Retriever? Husky Retriever. Husky Retriever. Oh, that explains the fur. Anyways, <laughs> um, they tend to fart quite a bit, and they're also, like, one of them's a boxer, so just, like, dumb and in your face. And whenever we're, like, podcast, when we used to podcast upstairs before uh, Hurricane Mika took over, um, the dogs would come hang out, hang out with us, and I used to push them to the living room because I had no interest in them crop dusting us or making a ton of noise. And I... I I always felt bad, and I would sometimes catch some flack for just being so, like, annoying about it. And then today, uh, uh, Ollie comes downstairs, the boxer, and Mika comes downstairs as well to come say hi to me. Um, so Brad, myself, Ollie, and Mika are downstairs, and uh, I'm obviously paying attention to the toddler who's trying to show me her toys and who needs caring for. And uh, Ollie uh, decides he doesn't like this, and um, ta uh, takes a big leak all over the floor and just walks upstairs, trailing the urine upstairs with him. The real exclamation mark was almost a literal exclamation mark of piss that he left on the stairs. Yeah, the night, the little dribble at the end. Yeah, he, he very, very, very infrequently pisses in the house, but he does it out of spite and anger. And I, he's been whining all day and I've had, like, just gotten annoyed with it. So I started like just ignoring it towards the end of the day. I'm like, no fatty, you've eaten enough today. And then he was whining right before he got here, and I'm like, no, I fed you an hour ago, you're not getting more food. Then he comes downstairs, and in his old man rage, as we start ignoring him and paying attention to Mika, he's like, yeah, fine, pisses on the floor, and walks away while still pissing, just to make his point. Yeah. Yeah. Which so, is stupid on him, because he's a short-haired dog, and it's minus 15 outside, and when he pisses on the floor, he knows he's going straight in the backyard, so that, that wasn't a good call on his part. No. But... You were on the floor with paper towels cleaning up dog urine thereafter, so I would call it at least a wash. Yeah. Anyhow, so uh, I'm going to maintain my current stance with your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Um, it's just two of us here today. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. Uh, Evan is dead. So that's tragic. You know, when one of us actually does die... Nobody's going to believe it. Nobody's going to believe it. We're going to need pictures of the body mm -hmm. and a death certificate yeah, posted yeah, yeah. online. Anyhow, so uh, we are currently taking applications for Evan. If you are super knowledgeable about hockey, uh, can like to contribute regularly, uh, know how to pace and tone yourself on a podcast, um, aren't terribly distracted by things like Clash of Clans and contribute uh, to the overall function and production of the show uh, in equal parts, then you are not qualified. Do not apply. <laughs> that is not what we're looking for to fill in Evan's role. <laughs> If you know what Evan was. You know where that joke's going, but the punchline is still satisfying. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the best part is Evan will never hear it. No, God, no. <laughs> and he's even contributed to this post. But in typical confused Evan, Evan fashion, instead of revealing his mid-season awards on the podcast, he just posted them online already. He just <laughs> tweeted them, yeah. I saw it. I was like, all right, man. <laughs> sure. On, and in typical of fashion, absolutely pick the consensus pick on every pick. On everything, yeah. Uh, in today's episode, uh, we are going to be chatting a little bit about the All-Star Game. It happened, and so we're going to talk about it. Briefly. Um, and then we're going to do our own mid-season awards, and we'll be revealing, in case you don't uh, follow Evan on Twitter, um, his, his awards, as well as ours. Um, and then we're going to be doing a little bit of a uh, hashtag deep dive on the uh, Craig Custance article um, about where the Red Wings stand with Jeff Blashill, which is truly an article about what the Red Wings coaching outlook is like, what the internal uh, perspective on what the coaching outlook is like, and then where the Red Wings are in terms of this transition into a young core, etc., etc. Uh, and then we have some quick hits, one of which is actually uh, kind of important, so we're looking to, uh, we'll chat a bit. But more of that, more about that. The All Star Game. Uh, someone tweeted at me. You can actually buy the jersey somewhere. Oh, yeah. I'm not gonna buy it. 
I like them. I, I like the jerseys, but I'm not going to buy them. If you could buy one, if you were given one of them for free, would you pick the white one or the black one? Black one, hands down. That's what I was thinking, too. All the pictures of Jimmy had him wearing the white one. Now, I, I don't know if I like the white one or the black jersey by itself more. Just the way they put together the whole uniform where they were wearing the black socks all the time, the white ones just looked beer league-ish. Mm. But I don't think that was a knock on the jersey so much as it was just the logistics of, well, we have to switch jerseys at intermission for a couple of the teams, so we can't no one's ask them to take their full gear off just to change their socks. Can you imagine? You know what they should have done? There's is, time to do it, but guys have rituals and superstitions and all that stuff that you do in between periods, so yeah, absolutely not. This was the right call, but yeah, it made, it made him look weird. You know what would have been a good idea is uh, reversible socks, because it would have been easy to just like roll a sock over itself. Not as easy to think. You'd have to still take your skates off. No, oh yeah, because the bottom taper is right. And depending on what type of um, jock you have, whether it's the hooks or the Velcro, yeah, that could also be. What are you, a hook or a Velcro guy? Velcro. I'm a Velcro guy. Too. So yeah. a bit more, bit more flexibility with it, and I like it. Um, the I'm gonna say something, and this is like my once in every seven episodes. Nice thing about Brad that I've been doing. I don't know whether why I'm doing this. Uh, Brad is coming out to uh, just a stick and puck tonight that I'm using to uh, get my feet back under me. It'll be my first time on the ice in like. I think I'm afraid to actually count, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's closer to two years than it is to one. <laughs> oh god! And I played like competitive hockey for 17 years, so this is not like me. And so I'm excited. Um, and I was telling a buddy of mine that I hockey has always been something that I've been legitimately like really good at. Like I've always been good at it. I, by no means was I pro, but like you know, if you if you play double A hockey, you're you're not a bad hockey player at all. Yeah. You it's competitive enough competitive enough for you to like grow and develop as a as a kid. Played up until I was 17 years old. Um, and when I play today, I'm going to have to face the fact that I've lost that. And I'm not ready for that. <laughs> it's not like riding a bicycle. No. Uh, so Brad's actually coming out before his shinny game just to get on the ice with me for half an hour. Which yeah. is, uh, Luckily, they're in the same building. Yes. I'm going to be that idiot running from rink to rink with my bag over my shoulder and my I full gear on. <laughs> <laughs> skate cards and everything. I don't have skate cards, but rim is all rubber, so it won't be an issue. Oh, is it? Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, so the All-Star Game. Uh, Sidney Crosby, tournament, or All-Star Game MVP. I don't care. It's so important to, to get the All-Star Game MVP. I don't care. I actually, off the top of my head right now, despite watching, briefly watching a replay of it 30 minutes ago, can't actually tell you who was in the last game, in the third period. I know it was a Metro, because Sidney Crosby won it. I don't remember. It was the Sen... Troll. Uh, yes? Yes? I can't, I actually don't know. I, I, I actually could care so little about the All-Star game itself. I was, I actually was way more entertained by the skills competition, truthfully. The Metro beat the Central 10-5. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Uh, so the skills competition was a, um... The only part of the All-Star game we're actually going to talk about. I, I can't remember her name. Um, are we talking about fastest skater or puck relay? Puck relay. Or passing sure. relay or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Brianna Decker. Yes, okay. So she beat out, her like demonstration time was actually faster than David Pasternak's. Leon Dreisett. I got my stuff all mixed up. Yep. Uh, you deliver it then, Brad. Okay, so Decker, so for those who didn't watch the skills competition, what the NHL did um, to incorporate a bit, a bit of women's hockey flair into the skills competition is for the fans, they've always run a demonstration of each event. So someone does a run through to show everybody how the event's supposed to go. So I guess they know if one of the players screws up or misses a section, yada, yada, yada. So I think last year too, I don't remember, but I know this year they, they brought out a couple of uh, players from the Team Canada and Team USA women's hockey team to run the demonstrations. And the passing relay, which is probably the hardest of all the competitions, like people who don't play hockey don't truly understand how difficult that is. Those tiny baby nuts are like... The ones in the first part where you have the target, but it's about six inches off the ice, and you have to hit it? That's that's an impossible pass. That's nuts. Um, so anyways, Leon Dreisaitl won at a minute six seconds. And someone went back and checked. I guess they just recorded, uh, like, did their own time off the video. Brian, Brian Decker's demonstration was a minute three. <laughs> So she actually kind of technically won the event, <laughs> which was impressive. 
So there, there was this whole hashtag started on, tw on Twitter called Pay Decker because the winner of each event got $25,000, which for us normies, Leon Dreisettle winning $25,000 is like us finding a toonie on the ground. Yeah. It's not a large sum of money. I think he's making $9 million this year. Um, so CCM ended up stepping up and be like, all right, we're going to hashtag Pay Decker, and they gave her... $25,000 for winning it. I think the NHL actually went back and did a formal timing of her thing, and I, I guess she was just a little longer than Dreisaitl officially, but who cares? The fact that at, at worst, she finished second is insane. Uh, there was... Uh, the, the NHL did donate $25,000 uh, each to a charity in the name of Brianna Decker, Renata Fast, Rebecca Johnson. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I did not hear that yet. That was like, and that was like announced at the event. But everyone yeah. was saying like donating to charity and their name's cool, but they also like are not paid. Like, yeah. So that's why they're saying paid Decker. So CCM stepped up. Yeah. Other notable um, events are, or other well, notable female participants. Yeah, I was gonna say we gotta go to the next big part of the All Star Skills Competition, the speed fastest skater. Fastest speed skater. So Kendall uh, Coin Schofield put up a time of fourteen point three seven six. Um, McDavid won fastest skater for the third straight year. Yeah, shocking. Uh, with a time of 13.378. So she was a second slower than the fastest human being alive. Yeah. Well, that was in the All-Star game. That fastest human being alive on skates. That was in the All-Star game. I don't know if Hey, I... our, friend, our friend of the pod, Jeff Merrick, thinks Athanasiu could have gone faster. I think Athanasiu can beat anybody in the league if we're going goal line to goal line, but I don't think he has the edges that McDavid and Larkin do. So I think since we're doing a lap, yeah. Athanasiu falls under like third on my list. The um, only person on whose edge work I've seen that rivals McDavid's is Sidney Crosby's. Yeah, McDavid. Skinner's up there. Yeah, Skinner's yes, up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, Skinner is a very With good. that figure skating background, that helps. Um, so Larkin's record remains unbeat. Asterisk, With the asterisk. Yeah. I, it, it's still infuriating to me that that they did that. How, that that's did such that. a big oversight because I yeah. still think he could have beat it. Yeah. Oh yeah, he stumbled on his lap. Like, yeah. Um, but we'll get back to this. What what I was so getting back to the Kendall Coin thing for anybody who didn't get the background um, in the Colorado Avalanche Minnesota Wild game on Wednesday, Nathan McKinnon took a puck to the foot. He was an All Star captain. He had to be there, but he couldn't really skate because his, I guess his foot was all swelled up or whatever. So he, he was there, but he wasn't participating, but he was supposed to participate in the fast skater competition. So they're like, we need a replacement. And I don't know whose idea it was, but Kendall Coyne got picked because she was already going to be there. And the most impressive part, not only that she was reasonably close to McDavid, there were eight competitors in this event. She did not finish eighth. She skated a faster lap than Clayton Keller. Yep. Who's a really damn good skater. <laughs> she uh, it was impressive. Yeah, she was very... And, like, women's hockey often gets chided as being, like, slower paced. And this was just such a cool... It was cool to... Like, all the criticisms aside of how things were handled afterwards with, like, the money and what have mm -hmm. you, it was a great sense of exposure. And, like, it's great that the conversation is happening more prominently now about how to give women's hockey the credit it deserves on the national and the international stage. Um, Prashanth actually put out a fantastic tweet that kind of, it's like one of those things that like summarized all of her thoughts. It's not hard to like conclude these things, but it was like, get one formalized national women's hockey league. Yes, a million times yes. Please, for the love of all that is good, the NHL and its players need to do a better job of promoting it and supporting it because obviously women's hockey will always need that support to get the, the recognition it deserves. And start, like, you can't be a, a sport that is committed to diversity and inclusivity and, and, you know, hockey for everyone by leaving out half the population. No, 100% not. Now, that being said, there have, there have been one or two NHL teams that have partnered up with their local CWHL team. Um, for example, the Montreal Canadiens um, had the Montreal team. I think they actually renamed the women's hockey team to Les Canadiens, E-N-N-E-S. Oh, nice. And so they have a really good partnership going in Montreal with their CWHL team. I don't remember. I want to say the Leafs do have an affiliate, do have have some sort of connection to the Furies, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. But yeah, the whole for anybody that doesn't know, 
The CWHL is the longest running, I'm going to put air quotations, professional women's hockey league. But they weren't a professional hockey league because their players weren't getting paid for the longest time. And it was a relatively small league. So, when I guess someone got the idea to come up with a professional women's hockey league where they got played. So the NWHL was formed. And that was based uh, four teams in the eastern United States. So the CWHL a year after that league was formed followed suit and started paying. Now these, these women are not getting paid a living wage doing this. They still have to work in the off season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, unless they're, they're big enough and popular enough like Hillary Knight or um, uh, Marie Philippe Poulain where they can ride some sponsorships and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the, their countries, well obviously their countries do pay them some, some form of payment for competing internationally because we had the Team USA women almost holding out of the World Championships last year over a dispute over it. Anyways, the NWHL has kind of been run poorly, I'll say politely. Uh, hasn't got the traction it needed. The CWHL is doing all right, but again, it doesn't get the traction it deserves in Canada because it doesn't have a heavy marketing budget and most of the teams play in markets where there's already an NHL team, so it's it's hard to overcome it is that massive yeah. shadow unless there's a partnership. I think that's why Le Canadien are doing so well because the, the Montreal Canadiens have embraced it because you've got the Toronto Furies. Even um, Mark, there's a Markham Stars team. Is it Stars? Well, they have the Dallas Stars jerseys. I'm, I might be forgetting the team name. That's still in the GTA. There's the Calgary Inferno. So obviously they're living in the shadow of the Flames. Boston Pride, they got to deal with the Bruins. So it's just, although the one thing where the CWHL has been very progressive, where the NHL has been trying and failing, is the CWHL has two teams in China. Wait, Wait what? Yeah. Yeah, the CWHL. Uh, the, what, arguably the best goalie in women's hockey, uh, Nora Ratu, plays in Kunlun. No way. Yeah. So, like, the CWHL is a very progressive league that's doing everything right. They are just handcuffed with a very small budget. So, if the NHL could come together, I'm not it's necessarily out and out purchasing these leagues, but forming some sort of, sort of partnership just to get more eyes on it so the CWHL and the NWHL themselves can form their own advertising revenue, can get more ticket sales. Because it is good hockey. Because... People, the argument I see over and over and over and over again that kills me is like, yeah, I'm not watching women's hockey. It's not as good as the NHL. Okay, well, do you watch college hockey, junior hockey, the AHL? None of that's as good as the AHL, but we all still watch it. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, you sure it's, as hell watch it in the Olympics when it's on. It's yeah, just that it doesn't have exposure. The Canada-U.S. women's Olympic gold medal games are some of the best Olympic hockey games ever played. End of statement. Like, that's not just saying women's hockey. It's overall. That the 2014 gold medal game... The overtime winner by Pula, that was insane. The shootout, last gold medal game in um, Korea that ended in a shootout on that ridiculous move by, oh, I'm forgetting the American player's name, it still haunts my dreams. Anyways, but it's just, the NHL is a very progressive league in the sense that they accept the, they have the programs for uh, gay athletes and all that stuff. They're, they've launched um, Black Hockey History Month that's coming up later this year, which is great. They have to, Put up or shut up now, though, with with women's hockey. It's, Get involved. It's, like, they should see the media, like, outcry. They should see, like, the social media, like, voice that's come from this. And everyone's saying, like, no, it's just people reacting to something that happened. Well, yeah, but it's not a nothing. Sure, if this person that you don't know doesn't get the $25,000, is your life changed? No. It's not about the $25,000, though. It's about putting, like... These are just hockey fans who want hockey to grow. And you made a great point. Do you watch the A? Do you watch juniors? Do you watch your kids, you know, travel or rep game? Do you watch, um, you know, like if a KHL or, or a European game is on sometimes? Like, yeah, inevitably you'll watch some form of hockey that isn't hockey at its finest. Grow the sport. Include the other half of the world in it. It is good for the game. And if you want to be very, very narrow-minded and selfish about this, if you're the NHL... It is good for business. It's yeah. half the population. The more women you get into hockey from a young age and involved, that's more eyes you have on the game. That's more merchandise you're going to sell. And again, from the, the argument argument of a competitive, uh, uh, competitive balance standpoint, because obviously Canada and the U.S. dominate international 
hockey because Finland, Sweden, Russia, there are countries that are catching up slowly. Those teams start getting better, start creating a greater competitive balance, start creating a bigger audience outside of North America. Better for business. You get more girls involved in hockey, so now the quality of hockey is going to get better because there's going to be more talent in the pool. 100%. It's everything about this is a win for the NHL. They just need to do something. And I understand there's a lot of logistics going on between the CWHL and the NWHL. And is it going to end up being one league? Is it going to end up being two leagues? Do we outright buy the leagues? Do we form a partnership? How do we do it? What about the China teams? Nobody said this is going to be simple. But you have to do something. Uh, I, I want to say one last thing about this topic. Um, this isn't... It's not something that needs to be said for most people, um, so forgive me if this is like a preaching to the choir or like you're just trying to ride a high horse, that's not what I'm trying to do here. If if you ever hear, or if you're the person who says, like, pulls up this straw man argument, and this is a straw man argument of, well, women shouldn't be saying that they can do anything men can do. I think someone uh, said, like, women can do anything men can do. No one is out there saying that a women's professional hockey team will be in, uh, like a, an NHL team. No one is saying that. No one is pretending that's the case, and that's not what it's about. So if that's the thought that comes to your mind, or if that's your defense like against like promoting women's hockey more, just do everyone a favor. Please shut up. Just just shut up. That's not what it's about. All right? Just like, that's not what it's about. They're saying women. It, it's that beautiful spiel that Brad just gave you. That's what's, what it's about. Hockey is a sport for everyone. Everyone. And that's what they mean. By we can do everything yeah. men can do. They should be doing men every, everything men are doing. Well, like the argument I don't want to hear anymore is when we're talking about is Marie Philippe Poulin is such a terrific hockey player for a woman. If we can just get to the point where we're saying that sentence without the just get rid of the woman at the end. yeah, get rid of those last three words from that sentence and it's fine. Marie Philippe Poulin is a tremendous hockey player. Yeah, because when you're watching a team like the OHL, like a team like the Kitchener Rangers in the OHL. I go to that game and I go, wow, Riley Damian, he's a great hockey player. I don't qualify by saying, for a junior player. Yeah. No, he's a great hockey player. I went and watched the game. He had a huge game. It was entertaining. Great. He's a fantastic hockey player. That's what we mean when we say, we just want them to be hockey players. We want them to be treated as equal. Uh, we're going to move on to, you know, I was going to do this in the quick hits, but I kind of want to chat about it now. Okay. Um... There was a, 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 a restaurant slash bar, um, or I think just a restaurant, that burned down in uh, Toronto, or the Toronto area, uh, burned to the ground, and it was called the Detroit Eatery. It was essentially like a Detroit sports bar, Detroit sports restaurant. Um, we, true, like, I, I had heard mention of it before. I'd never been there, to be completely honest. Uh, we haven't ever, like, been around there, but... Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a podcast that's run in Ontario, Canada. We're close to Toronto. We're about an hour away, so we're behind we're, enemy lines. We're closer to Toronto than we are Detroit. Not a huge difference, but yeah, we got enough of one. It's a, it's a like we do come down to Detroit games, but it's a drive for us, and so we're kind of transplant. Well, I'm a transplant from like right across the river from Detroit, but we're essentially uh, foreigners out here. Um, this is a bar that burned down to the ground. Um, obviously. Uh, it's hard to find any sense of like Detroit sports support out in this part of the world. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it kind of hits close to the heart. So the Detroit Eatery restaurant um, burned down and they have a GoFundMe page. Uh, we'll tweet out the link um, and the Wing Wheel podcast is going to be contributing to um, yeah, the, GoFundMe. the GoFundMe to restore this restaurant to its former glory and even better. Um, and once it is back up and running, we're definitely going to get out there. A hundred percent. I didn't ever know this place existed. So when I, I saw it, it was a Paul and Greg Krupa today posted it on my Paul, timeline. Paul, I believe it's Paul Wallin. Paul Wheelins. Paul Wheelins. Paul Wheelins. Sorry. Something like that. By the um, Lake Six. Yeah. And um, so they tweeted, they caught our eye, and they're like, "All right. So now, when uh, inevitably in uh, five years, when Detroit beats Toronto in the Eastern Conference Finals, we'll have to go down." Oh, yeah. And celebrate in Toronto at this Detroit eatery. Because hopefully the GoFundMe is successful and this place can be restored. Because yeah. it sucks to put your entire life into a business like that and then to basically lose it. Okay. So all the best to owner Chris, uh, owners Chris and Alex. Um, and, and here's to a speedy uh, rebuilding process. 
Um, all right, our mid-season awards. Speedy rebuilding process. That, that, <laughs> this, really, this really is a Detroit bar. <laughs> it really, really is. Um, our mid-season awards. Uh, so uh, for those of you who listened to last episode, you'll know that our stipulation was, even though Evan knew he wasn't going to be here, if he reached 1,000 followers, he would have to contribute his mid-season awards. So you guys did it. You did the impossible. You got Evan to contribute to an episode where he wasn't even here. Almost. Like he did. Almost. Almost. Had we actually recorded this morning when we were supposed to, it would have been touch and go. Yeah, he's lucky we got about a foot of snow last night. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll start off with Evan's awards. Yeah. Let's go for it. So uh, Evan's heart trophy, What he he was, Evan was milk toast. <laughs> oh, yeah. He went, he really thought outside the box on these picks. Uh, his heart trophy winner, Nikita Kucherov. Uh, Vesna, uh, John Gibson. The Norris trophy winner was Mark Giordano. The Calder went to Pedersen. Uh, his Selkie award winner pick uh, was Barkov, as well as his Lady Bing winner, uh, also Barkov. And then uh, Barry Trotz for Jack Adams. He didn't pick a GM of the year. And he also wrote Rocket to the Sun, Blash Hill. So he didn't pick a GM of the year, but he did give us that little bonus. There you go. Very controversial pick there. Evan. Yeah. I, I will be disagreeing with some of his. Uh, do you, but not all. What are yours? Do you want to go through yours? How about I'll read out pick by pick and then we'll go yeah, through. Yeah, you read through the uh, award and then we'll go through our winner, runner-up, finalist. All right, the Hart Trophy. My winner, Yeah. and I'm going to be banging this drum till the day I die or until that team gets really good, Connor... McDavid. This is the award for most valuable player to his team. I know the Western Conference is a dumpster fire right now, but somehow that team is still very much in the playoff race. Um, I was torn. I think Nikita Kucherov's performance shouldn't be overlooked. However, I agree with you. Until they change the definition mm -hmm. of that award, most valuable player should go to most valuable player. Yes, a lot of it should go to like raw point output or things like that. That's but what, that's what the Aros is for. Connor McDavid wins in my mind with Nikita Kucherov as the runner-up. Uh, Johnny Goudreau in third place for me. I prob I, so I have McDavid winning. Yeah. I have Kucherov as my runner-up because you cannot ignore that. My finalist is way outside of the box because I don't think he's getting enough credit this year for the season he's had. But John Gibson. Uh, if Anaheim were doing better, I would say yes. They were. They are fighting for a playoff spot just that, despite having the worst metrics in just about every category you can imagine. I don't think you're far off, and I, I wouldn't be surprised. The the bias yeah. against goalies in the heart race will probably mean you're wrong technically in the end. Yeah. You oh, yeah. It, there's no case. way he's actually going to be finalist. I just think... Again, we have to look at the definition of this award. I even hesitate putting Kucherov in there because I still think Tampa's in first place without him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, Anaheim was a team by all standards that they had league average goaltending right now are dead last in the Western Conference. Mm -hmm. They have worse metrics than Chicago, than Los Angeles, than Detroit. The Gross. Only, the only team that has worse overall shot metrics in the NHL this year than the Anaheim Ducks is the Ottawa Senators. That's it. Anaheim should be second last place in the NHL, and they're not. They were in a playoff spot until like 10 days ago. Yeah, uh, the Norris Trophy for the best uh, defenseman all around. Uh, I'm agreeing with Evan here. It's Mark Giordano. I think it's Mark, Gi Mark Giordano as well. I, I'm going to be I'm going to be forthcoming about my bias. You know, this is a, we're fans of a team that had Nick Lidstrom, who didn't win a lot of his uh, Norris trophies until later in his career. Um, I think Mark Giordano his cumulative like career output is giving him a lot of favor here, but I also think for him to be having this season at the age of what thirty seven. Yeah, uh, not not that I like plus minus as a stat, but he's something like plus thirty five halfway through the season. That's absurd. Calgary is one of the ones thirty five years old. Sorry. Yeah, Calgary's top three team in the league. Something like that. Yeah, he's contributing at both ends of the ice to one of the best teams in the league. It's it's impressive. Again, he's a complete player. I would love to give this award to Morgan Riley or Thomas Shabbat right now, but the defensive side of their games is not weak, but it leaves a little to be desired. There's nothing to be desired about Jared Allen's game right now. Uh, how do you feel about John Carlson as a top three? He's probably my finalist. I, I have John Carlson... I'm going to be fair to Morgan Riley and put him second. 
That's where I am. Yeah. He's. I don't. I think his defensive game does not. You know, it's nothing to be. You know, proud of it's in terms bad. of award winning. It's not yeah. bad, but it's not award winning. Yeah. And that's what makes me think that Carlson might go over him. But Riley is having a phenomenal mm -hmm. season. Yeah. Um, so I have uh, Riley and Carlson rounding that out. The Calder Trophy, um, rookie of the year. <laughs> anybody who even entertains the thought of anybody but Elias Pedersen doesn't deserve to watch hockey. Uh, we've we've said a lot of people are the closest thing this league will have to Datsu. Um, Elias Pedersen is, in terms of like excitement and ability to create magic on the ice, is the closest thing this league has to Datsu right now. He's the rookie of the year, whether you like it or not. Yep. Rasmus Dalin and Miro Heiskanen are having wonderful seasons. Yeah, this is the the part of the voting where there's no overthinking this one. No, the top three is Pedersen, followed by Dalin and Heiskanen. The only room for de uh, debate is do you put who do you put second, Dalin or Heiskanen? Yeah, and that's completely up to you. And right now, I probably have Heiskanen in there just because. Uh, he's he's a more complete player to me than Darlene. I don't think he's going to be a better player than Darlene long term. But hey, it's rookie of the year. Who's having the best season? Yeah, I think Haskinen's season season has been more impressive. Uh, the Selkie Trophy uh, for the forward who best excels in the defensive aspects of the game. Mark Stone. Mark Stone's not even on some people's list. Mark, because wingers don't get credit in this in no. this category, and he's on a terrible team. Uh, when you look at the with and without metrics on Ottawa or on Mark Stone, it's comical. We were laughing a few episodes ago about how like Detroit's uh, at Dylan Larkin's uh, Corsi Rell on Detroit is just laughable how far ahead he is the rest of the team. Yeah. I think the only player that was ahead of him in the league in that category was Mark Stone. Um, I have Mark Stone admittedly third on my list. Um, I had Barkov first. I have Barkov as my runner-up. Uh, I have Claude Giroux second. Claude Giroux, eh? I, he didn't even register in my head. I had. It might be a weird pick, but it's for me. It's just one of those things where he's so terribly underappreciated all the time. You're right in that Mark Stone's probably a better pick for second. I'm probably being stupid here, but I really just kind of, I kind of have like a, a lot of admiration for Claude Giroux, and I think he should be recognized a little bit more. I um, have. Anyways, I had Ryan O'Reilly at number three. Also, yeah, Ryan O'Reilly's up there. Patrice Bergeron, obviously. Yeah, will, Bergeron would, would be up win. there if he didn't miss. If he missed a bunch of time with injury this year, so I think that's going to hurt his chances a little bit this year. It shouldn't, but it probably will. Uh, so the Vezina Trophy to the goaltender who is best at being John Gibson. It's John Gibson. It's John Gibson. <laughs> this, the people are talking, oh, maybe Vasilevsky, oh, maybe Freddie Anderson. Don't be stupid, guys. Again, this is another one of those ones. Do not overthink it. This is John Gibson, and it's not close. I, I think this is the easiest pick behind Pedersen yeah. for any of the awards It, it right really now. is. Um, I have uh, Frederick Anderson second, and then I actually have Marc-Andre Fleury beating out Vasilevsky. I had Vasilevsky to Fleury three. Yeah. Uh, the Lady Bing uh, to the player to have the activity of the best sportsmanship and gentlemanly conduct with a high standard of play. Um, I have Barkov for this. Barkov is my pick, and my runner-up is Samuel Girard. Okay. He's a defenseman who hasn't taken a penalty this year. Ah, all right. And he's not he's not having a bad year. Um, I, actually, sorry, I think I'm going to double-check. I think he may have taken a penalty in one of the last couple games, but I think it was for puck over glass. <laughs> the monster. Bra oh, my God. I want everyone who has a Girard jersey, all six of you, to burn them. <laughs> I'm pulling it up now. I want to double check here. I now that you talked about that. Nope, you still got zero penalty minutes. Fifty games played, fourteen. Points. Oh, I'm sorry for those of you who burned your jerseys. Uh, my runner-up was actually defenseman Morgan Riley. He has four penalty minutes. All yeah, game. he's a really good pick for that as well. Um, for you, for a player to be so offensively minded, uh, it means you're more prone to being out of position because you're a defenseman. Uh, and for you to have four penalty minutes, good for you. Um, and then I had Johnny Goudreau just as like a yeah. Yeah, that one's pretty good. She's just cute. Jack Adams Award uh, to the coach who is not Mike Babcock on any given year. Well, this one's obvious this year. It's Barry Trotz. The Islanders went from 31st out of 31 teams for goals against in the league to first. He uh, is actively winning the fight against Lou Lamorello to make this team good. Yeah. Um, Lou Lamorello made some questionable moves in the offseason, and Barry Trotz is doing wonders with this team. And by the from the PWH... Uh, PWHA's 
mid-season awards, they had Lamarello as a finalist for GM of the Year. I think he's finalist of GM of the Year solely for hiring Barry Trotz. Yeah. Uh, I maybe, will. maybe the Robin Leonard signing, because he's, he's been unreal. Um, second, I have Bill Peters from Calgary. So this is where I'm putting Trotz there, because... I hate that the Jack Adams has become the your team is better than we thought award. Yeah. But just because we can look at one very specific metric with just how Trotz has turned that team around, with basically the same roster minus John Tavares, I think that this actually qualifies in this. So two coaches who are going to get overlooked for this award this year, and that I'm putting as my runner-up and my finalist, is because their teams were expected to be good, and they are very good. Can I guess one of them? Yes. John Cooper. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to take a guess at the other one? Uh, 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 Vegas, I can't remember. Gerard Gallant, yes. yes. These teams are continuing to be unbelievably good, and Vegas's roster is not that much improved from last year. I think it's I, last year. In, in a season where everybody was like, oh my god, they're so amazing, we didn't expect this. They get up to a really rocky October this year, and now they're like, what, fifth overall in the league again? Oh my god, they're really good again with the same <laughs> roster. So it's, I'm giving it to Trotz, Cooper's my runner up, Gallant's my finalist. I, yeah, I have Trotz, Peters, and then Cooper. Um, I think honorable mentions do go to Gallant as well as Claude Julien for the age old. You're making a pretty rough team do well. Yeah. Um, although, <laughs> as much as it pains me to say, a lot of that credit does also go to Mark Bridgman. Uh, speaking of which, GM of the Year. This award I hate. Because, again, it generally goes to who, which team had the better year than we thought when... A good GM will have a good season because of moves he's been making over the last three to five years, right? So you can't just look at what one GM did in one offseason and go, yeah, yeah, you're, you're the top GM. E, that's it's garbage. So what I like looking at is teams that should have started declining a long time ago that didn't. So my GM of the year is Doug Wilson. It's my GM of the year. San Jose by some miracle, continues to be one of the best teams in the league year after year after year, despite every key player on the roster seemingly getting old as hell. You signed Eric Carlson. Then they got Eric Carlson, and then they properly develop prospects. A guy like Timo Meyer, who nobody was thinking too much of, is now probably going to hit 30 goals this year. They find those undrafted free agents or late-round picks like Kevin LeBanc, season them for the right amount of time, and he's a useful NHLer. They get every last drop that they can out of a guy like Joe Thornton. They somehow manage to have infinite salary cap space seemingly every year, despite having Brent Burns, Joe Thornton, Joe Pavelski, Logan Couture. It's it's yeah. insane. I think he's yeah. I think Doug Wilson has done an incredible job. Um, in my mind, he is the he won't be recognized as this way, but he is a shoe in. Um, I also want to recognize Brad Treliving for what he's done in Calgary. Yeah, he's my runner up. And then I have Kevin uh, Shevel Day off of Winnipeg in third. I'm going to go my third one. I, I keep flip-flopping over a, a bunch of teams in my mind, but I am going to go with David Poyle. Nashville is once again real good. He got Saros under contract for... He, he's got the Pekka Rene succession plan there. Pekka Rene signed for a couple more years at less cap. Mm -hmm. Then he's making, which rarely happens. Um, still has one of the best defenses in the league. They still score enough goals, but the key thing is he has cap room, so he's got he can do almost whatever he wants at the deadline, which not every team in a position to succeed can do. Uh, and I think the only award left is to just pick the comeback player of the year. Is award. that what they renamed the Masterton? Uh, I think it's still called the Masterton. I'm not. Well, it could be called. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's going to go to Robin Leonard. It's 100% yeah. Robin Leonard. Yeah. The dude almost lost his career last year because of a mental illness, and he comes back and is now one of the best goalies in the league. Like, if he continues his first half and the second half, he's probably in the conversation to be in a Vezina finalist. Like, I think he was fifth on my list. So it's it's mental, the season he's having. Those are our mid-season awards. Uh, if you... Uh, have your own thoughts, smash that subscribe button, comment down below. I'm kidding, this isn't a YouTube video. I mean, it, it will be, but we, I mean, tweet at us. At Winged Wheel Pod, uh, follow us, and then go to our bio, and then follow our individual accounts. Hey, you guys did a wonderful job, because you jumped in, uh, and as you were following Evan, 
also followed us. Did your followers jump quite a bit? Yeah, I, yeah. Had, a, I had a pretty big rise. I thought it was just because of my wit. Oh, yeah. And, I, and I, my daily tankathons. I thought it was my broad shoulders. <laughs> uh, but keep that up. If you're not following the podcast, it's a great way to stay connected with us at Winged Wheel Pod. Hit that follow button and then go to our bio, our individual accounts. You'll notice that Brad, myself, and even Evan are on Twitter way too much. Follow us. I was going to say, the beauty of following Evan is you get to give him the support and it won't affect your timeline at all. (laughs) Uh, So we got Evan to 1,000 followers, which was great. Um, Our last main topic uh, was an article that was put out on The Athletic um, by Craig Custance, and he, he, it was essentially where where things stand with Jeff Blaschel and the Red Wings. Um, Because he made a really good point that whatever decision the Red Wings are going to make with Jeff Blaschel, they likely have to make before the trade deadline because it will not be fair to assess the team's performance after the deadline if they sell off a Jimmy Howard, a Gus Nyquist, a uh, a Nick Jensen, because that would be three very key pieces of the team that he no longer has to play with. Yeah, Not that they will trade all those players, but they'll be a different team. Yeah. Um, a younger team, which again, as much as we want to see, is not going to translate to W's on the scoreboard. So yeah, it's it's probably fair to Blashill to have that decision made by the deadline. Uh, and one thing I really liked about this um, article is that uh, Craig didn't really beat around the bush. He he addressed the elephant in the room, which is that everyone and their mother is expecting Steve Eisenman to be the GM of this team in a year, if not two, or two years, if not one. Um, that's hard because Ken Holland is the one making the call uh, as to who the coach is going to be. And so, the, I was actually thinking of the bigger issue here. It's not the coach. It's so. Let's assume I'm just going to go. I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here, just because you did remind me of this. One of the biggest issues the trade might have in this off season is if Ken Holland um, is going to be is going to move on from Detroit to replace Steve Eisman. They cannot do that till July 1st, which means Steve Eisenman is not running the draft, and if Ken Holland is leaving the Red Wings organization like four days later, that's not a great scenario. They're going to want to keep him. Yeah, ideally, Ken Holland's going to move on to a higher, more cushy position in the Red Wings organization, and then Eisenman takes over, but it's... It's going to be an uneasy proposition unless Tampa graciously lets Eisenman out of his contract a uh, month early, which if they did that as a favor to a rival team in their same division, they're crazy. No, Never in a million years would I let, them, would I let Detroit do that if I'm Tampa. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that's going to be an interesting scenario. It won't affect the coach too much because they don't have to extend Blashill before July 1st. They can make the coaching decision after July 1st. So whether that's still Ken Holland or whether that's Steve Eisenman, there's not a rush on that. But yeah, right now that's the biggest question mark of do I think Jeff Lash will be back next year? My answer depends on who the GM is. Is Chris Illich too hands off to is uh, sorry, I'm gonna not frame this in, the, in a question. I have a, a small concern that Chris Illich is too hands off to properly address this scenario right now. Because this is the first time the Redmonds have faced this situation in my lifetime. 25 years old, I've never seen this before. No, I, I I think Chris Illich is a businessman. I think he's looking at the numbers. Detroit is not even coming close to selling out games this year. He, he notices that. If there's one thing in the back of my head that tells me we might see significant change in the offseason, it's going to be that. I think the thing I truly appreciate about Chris Illich and the Illiches in general is they're hockey fans, but they know they don't know the, the first thing about hockey. They can't run a hockey team. That's why they trust the people who are in their positions to run the hockey team. So it's going to be interesting because when the business starts suffering, I think that's when heads start to roll. The business is now suffering. So as much as I generally side by the, this is Detroit, nothing's going to change. We're coming back next year with the status quo. I'm still leaning towards that, but I can, I can see a shakeup coming. Um, there, the issue is, they've shown a certain amount of they've shown a certain amount of res, like receptiveness to like social media and like public outcry. Like it's not a secret that fans are just pleased with Holland and Blash Hill, or there at least is like a, a minority or a very loud minority that are displeased with them. 
but they have showed a certain amount of resilience uh, to those notions. Yeah. And so my concern comes with, you know, looking at the numbers, Detroit doesn't matter if you're a detractor of Detroit or you're a fan of an opposed, a rival team, you have to admit that Detroit is a rock solid hockey market even when the team is bad. And when the team is on, they're among the best in the world in terms of like a uh, business hockey market. We are hockey town. They are hockey town. De Detroit, it, like we are hockey town. I, I to be fair, I, I'm just so Ravens fans don't jump on me about dumping on the team for not selling out games this year. Ticket prices have a ton to do with that. Yeah, the the new arena they're trying to fund it. I'm sorry, I'm not paying a hundred dollars to sit up a bowl to watch a garbage team. I will pay twenty dollars, thirty dollars, forty dollars to watch a garbage team mm -hmm. comfortably. But yeah, no. Because what, what was it? We bought seven tickets in the home opener. We had pretty good seats, but that was what, fifteen hundred dollars for the tickets. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was quite a bit. Yeah, it's insane. Like we, I was comfortable doing that once, and we, that was partly because we were that was we were doing it as a reward for a couple of our listeners as well. But yeah, would I do that multiple times a year? God no. And it's hard because like those were nice seats, but it, this isn't the Joe where you can sit in the nosebleeds and still feel like you can like you know. Tap Erickson's shoulder and tell him to piss off. Yeah, uh, the, the LCA is a little bit different. It's a little bit steeper. Um, if you're not in the mezzanine or the lower bowl, you do have kind of not so great sight lines. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the game. You want to enjoy. It's a premium experience. It's going to cost you a premium. It's going to be a premium price tag. Um, yeah. So the 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 article I think did a good job. It outlined the fact that there is technically a deep pool of coaches. None of them really struck my fancy in terms of like ideal coaches. No, Alain Vigneault and Michel Terran being mentioned scared the ever-living hell out of me. Even Mike Yo, like I didn't like, it, like even Joel Quenville, who I would love as a Red Wings coach, isn't technically what they need right now, which is someone who is a, I, they essentially need to do what Eisenman do with John Cooper and take a risk on someone who you think can win, but is also a good developer of your players. I think that's a, a strong likelihood, but I will argue your Joel Quenville point. And I and this isn't dumping on you. I have seen a ton of people make this point. Oh, we can't bring in Joel Quenville. He's a coach for a winner, not a rebuild. Um, does everybody forget when he took over Chicago, they were like a bottom three team in the league? Yeah. He's been down this path before. I am perfectly comfortable bringing Joel Quenville into this scenario. Um, the two names that that Custon specifically mentioned that intrigued me were Quenville and Todd McClellan. Todd McClellan's a good coach, he's done it with young teams, uh, and he has he's won a Stanley Cup with the Detroit Red Wings as an assistant coach. So he's not unfamiliar with the organization or the market or anything like that. If it's not one of those two guys, I would rather see them venture into a Ricard Gronberg or a uh, Again, a coach, a Sheldon Keefe, somebody who's got a great track record at a lower level, take the gamble. I know that's what they did with Blashill, and it hasn't worked out necessarily, mm -hmm. but you can't let one bad day keep you out of the pool. No, no. Uh, I really like the Todd McClellan pick as well. Um, I think it's a good balance if the Reckons are looking for someone who knows the culture in the organization. They don't want to go too far off. Um, and I think the guy just kind of got a raw deal in Edmonton. Yeah, he did. He absolutely did. Like, even a guy like Dallas Akins, who's doing very well, um, I think, with San Diego in the AHL, is starting to get some NHL looks. He's only had one NHL job that went poorly, but it was a dumpster fire of an Edmonton Oilers team. So, yeah. if they wanted to give someone like that a shot, sure, I'm not against it, but... Again, this is essentially what they just did with Blash Hill, except they invested all the time and energy in developing and bringing up Jeff Blash Hill. Mm -hmm. So I don't see them being eager to do it again with someone from outside of the organization unless they're established. And not that I necessarily agree with that outlook if I were the Red Wings. I fully understand it if that's what they're thinking. So I, I think we're more than likely, if, if they do move on from Blashville, to see them take a big swing at a Quentville or a McClellan or something like that. Now, they have, they're not going to hire a Kyle Dubas type, like it'd be equivalent to a coach. They're no. not going to hire a Kyle Dubas type, period, uh, even as a GM. Here's, a, here's a, the plain simple fact that I don't think gets enough attention. Um, Detroit is not spending enough time and resources on support staff specifically towards progressive analytics. We don't know that. 
Um, so, there, I Cousins has been on record as saying like he doesn't believe that they're spending enough. Enough, but they're not neglecting it because again, I think I've even told you. Um, just a, a fun little aside going back um, to last summer. So I have a friend of mine um, locally here, um, Alan Kiso, who's actually running for um, to be MPP of Kitchener and South Hesler. Um He hooked me up with a friend of his, um, Brandon Naruto, who did a lot of hockey um, statistical analysis and that kind of stuff. He actually, I think, contributed a couple articles to The Athletic. So he was scheduled to be on a podcast with us, and we were we were scheduling a time and then he went dark for a couple weeks and then just got back to me hey sorry man can't do it and then we got a press release a week later he got hired by the Red Wings to be mm -hmm. in their analytics department so they're not neglecting it but yeah they could definitely be investing more into it I I think for a team that's been mired with just like being held back by tradition and the legacy picks and, and, and you know the old boys club and what have you there needs to be a, an aggressive push towards this kind of thing I love the idea that Chris Draper and Sean Horkoff are pushing more progressive technologies and, and, and thinking in terms of how you, you design your team and develop your players and build your, your business and sports model. Um, but I want to know, as a fan of this team, that there's you know guys with computers in a room making like these evidence-based decisions, consulting with, with whoever's making these decisions who actually puts value in them. So yeah, it's good to know that they've been making those hires, but I there there are teams that are way ahead of them. Oh, I, I know, I do. Um, so let let's circle back to Blashill because that's what what I really want to dive into. So what Craig did great in the article was he knows the entire fan base is out for blood, and outside of the subreddit, I think most of the fan base is turned on Blashill, rightly or wrongly. So he did go specifically mention that Blashill has a very good reputation around the NHL. Mm -hmm. He, and so, as much as I like to dump him all the time, a reputation like that doesn't come from nothing. No. He's got to be doing a bunch of things behind the scenes, right? Um, I've read a lot that Jeff Blashill is, um, he takes a very much a teaching approach to coaching, which I appreciate. I actually like that strategy. He'll sit, spend a lot of time in the film room, break down plays. This is what you did, this is what I want you to do. Based on a lot of things I've seen with the team, and a lot of systems they implement, I'm not convinced he's teaching the right things, but I, I like that he takes that approach. He's a taskmaster, which you need to be as a, an NHL coach. You can't let people get away with stuff. You can't be afraid to sit somewhere. I disagree with the players he sits, but whatever, he has the balls to do it. No coach in the right mind who actually cared what the fan base thought would scratch Dennis Chalosky, okay? Again, insanely dumb decision, but it takes balls to do that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's even, because again, guys like Justin Applicator and Jonathan Erickson have not been healthy scratch this year, which is criminal because, I mean, these are, one of them missed an empty net breakaway, and the other guy is literally a rusted out Decepticon. It's, basically what I took from the article is Jeff Blashill is a very smart human being, who takes the right approach to everything. I just don't think he has the right mind for this game at this level. I just, I don't agree with his tactics. I don't agree, agree with the ways he thinks you win an NHL game. Like I said, everything Craig mentioned, I was was correct. I don't, I didn't disagree with much of anything he said. But it's all about context, right? Just simply saying he's a teaching coach does not mean what he is teaching is correct. By saying he's not afraid to make a hard decision does not mean the hard decisions he's making are the correct ones. This is, this, this is not a knock on Craig or anything. This is a very, very commonplace problem in hockey. By saying he has intangibles or all these vague terms that are technically true does not mean the person or the player is making the correct decision. There's, and people have a hard time separating that. There's this sentiment that we've seen from a lot of people who we know and respect, like Craig Max has said it a lot of times as well, where um, other people who are like involved in the league and, and speak to these guys on a regular basis and have a closer lens than we might, that Jeff Blashill's a smart guy, he knows what he's doing. It's not even that he's smart, he knows hockey. He's had a history of winning and developing players. Yeah. I, it all like, 
I, I gave so many benefits of the doubt, and I agree with you, Brad. There's just something that I, I think it's something that we're not paying attention to that we think that I think is objectively valuable towards being a good hockey coach that he's just not getting. Something's not clicking. I would like to think, for Blasio's sake, it's just a circumstance thing that if he goes somewhere else, he'll be more successful. But I tend to agree with you. I just don't think what he's doing now is what's right for an NHL team. I think he can get there. I just think this isn't it. It's not working right here. It's not working for the Red Wings. It's not... He has the reasoning behind things. I don't always agree with it, but it's not so crazy. I do not see his argument behind the Cholosky thing. I think it's mm. ass nine. No, and I, I think, again, as much as I actually respect Blash Hill, and I will respect any organization that absolutely does not care what the fans think, because you shouldn't. Fans are idiots. Mm -hmm. You should not ever make a hockey decision based on what the fan base wants. Scratching Cholosky in his hometown game the one time a year was unforgivable to me. You had... 40 games left in the season. You could have picked any one of them. That, that was just short-sighted, dumb. Sure, that's one oversight. Now, there's two other th arguments that I've heard around Blashill, and I think one of them Craig actually mentioned in his article, that I, I think is a flawed argument because people are not looking at the full context. One, he gets credit for the progression, uh, like uh, the progression in the careers of Dennis Cholosky, Andreas Athanasiu, Anthony Mantha, and Dylan Markin. Cholosky is the pleasant surprise this year that would, nobody was expecting to make the team this year, and he's having a huge year. And Mantha, Larkin, and Athanasiu are all on career paces this year. That's fantastic, and maybe. I'm not saying he is or isn't responsible for that. Please do not take this this way, but I'm presenting the other side of the argument here. We do not know that with a better coach or another coach, Larkin, Mantha, and Athanasi would not be having better seasons than they are now. Because I would argue that Larkin, I think this is about his peak. Whatever Blashill is doing with Larkin, it's working. I think Mantha should be ahead of where he is right now, and I think Athanasiu is probably at about where he should be, but I think there's another step to his game that can be developed outside of the goal scoring aspect. Um, I think. Again, you look at the decline in a whole bunch of satellite players in, over the Blashill's tenure, the Helm, the Advocators, uh, the Kaisers, the Dailies. We're not attributing that to Blashill. Again, these are all players that were never good to begin with, as good as the organization deemed them to be. But who's to say that their careers would have gone this far backwards with another coach? Advocator doesn't belong on an NHL roster right now. I'm... With Joel Quenville, maybe he's a, a respectable third line. Bad contract still, but that's not on the coach. I'm not holding Blashell responsible for that. Um, yeah, I have a hard time pinning him on Blashell. No, no, that one is. But I'm just saying, it's if we're going to give credit for the progression of some players, you have to then attribute the regression of players to the same coach over the same time frame. Nobody does that. And again, I'm not saying that any of these things are or are not Blashell's fault. I'm just saying you cannot use them as an argument. Because we do not know if Mantha or Athanasi or whoever would have progressed further with another coach. And the other argument is, well, he's won at every level with young players, so he must be good with the young players. Okay, that's a that's just a bad argument that I do not accept. In the AHL, in college hockey, almost every player is young. In fact, Grand Rapids had one of the more veteran teams in the AHL when he won. This is not him developing young players. This is him going into a completely even playing field with the rest of the league. And again, with how long it took some of these Red Wings prospects to actually develop and come up, and some of them that just didn't pan out, like a Yurko, for example, is that on Black Show? No. Again, you can't give him credit without looking at the alternative and the whole picture. Now, that being said, what I would take from the Black Hill winning at lower level argument, where there might be some credence to that, is when it was an even playing field and he had a good roster, he was able to turn them into a championship. If you gave Jeff Blashill, let's say Nashville right now, mm -hmm. could he implement a system with the way he coaches and take him to a cup final, win a cup? Possibly. We've never seen him coach a good team in the NHL. We do not know that. So I'm not going to sit here and say he's a, he's a terrible NHL coach. What my opinion on why Blashill needs to not be returning next year 
is based on the fact with a young rebuilding team, I the decisions he is making I do not agree with. I do not see the benefit. I think he's harming the team more than he's helping. As much as I like to go on my tangents for comedic relief and all that stuff, the reality is we should have seen more progression from the team at this point. We should have seen more progression from a bunch of the players, and we should have seen less regression from another bunch of players. The one thing where I will give him full credit, it he's a very defensive-minded coach, and the one area of this team where we've seen more progression than regression has been with the defense. Danny the Kaiser's bounced back. Nick Jensen has kind of broken out of nowhere. Nick Cronwall, for all we dump on him, is still somehow playing in the NHL under uh, Blashill's system. Chaloski, come out of nowhere. Peronik's having a huge year. There might be something to he actually can work with young defensemen and revive their careers. Fully possible. Uh, I'm going to move us on to overtime now. We do have a nice time to get to uh, a little bit later. Uh, overtime, of course, uh, we're gonna be at the door in about 20 minutes. is uh, we're going to go to a Patreon where our incredible patrons who are really the reason this show happens, uh, get their comments read out on air, guaranteed as our way of saying thank you. Uh, Garrett TV says, hey fellas, what the hell's going on with our special teams? The PK has been so-so, but I feel like the power play has just been frickin' abysmal. What up? Uh, what's up with Disco Dan's power play units? Let's go Red Wings. Uh, hey, they finally put Mantha in a shooting position on the power play, which was a plus, because they had been using him in an improper location all his career. So, hey... You know, baby steps. Uh, Ryan Pratt, this is a funny comment. Brad's going to, like, shoot through the roof. Hey, guys, a little off topic, but have you seen the show Letter Kenny? They have finally released all episodes in the States, but my wife and I, uh, well, we love the show a lot and found ways to watch it. Just curious on your thoughts if you've seen the show. Great work for the show, even though the audio got messed up last week. Uh, uh, that is my, it might be my favorite show on television. Funny enough, um, my friend that I mentioned earlier on the podcast, Alan Kiso, that's actually, he's actually the brother of Jared Kiso, the star and creator of Letterkenny. So um, Letterkenny, small quick aside, is based off of a, a, another town in Ontario called Listowel, Ontario. Listowel. Which is 30 minutes from here. It's, yeah. it's basically local to it's us. So a beautiful small town, Ontario. Yeah, so that show is very, very popular around here. Adam Flett says, slow Sunday after starting a new job this week, so of course I slipped into draft and prospect mode. In your opinions, even Evans, who's our top five forward prospects, top three, and top two goalie? Once you've answered that, how does it leave your thinking for the 2019 draft, and what do you feel the wings should target? Hope your week's been awesome and you tried at least one new beer. I've got a chili and chocolate porter being delivered this week. That's interesting. interesting. So we're talking Red Wings current prospects. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm going to struggle to get the five forwards. Um, Zadina? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, Svechnikov? Bergren? Yeah, Bergren. I don't know if I consider anybody beyond that a, a, a serious prospect, unless I'm forgetting some. Valeno? Oh, Valeno, I'm forgetting. Okay, so Zadina, Valeno, Jack Hughes, Svechnikov, Bergren. I mean. Yeah, okay. Um, I think if Def we put Sari Arby up forward, he'd probably be number five at this point. Yeah, defensive prospects, Sari Arby. Um, we're going Lee three Shulak. in order yeah. of potential. Any of them. Just put them um, in order. Sari Arby, McIsaac, Lindstrom. Okay, and goalies, Larson. Larson, Petrozelli, Eliasson. Yeah. Mm. Honorable mention, Ben Paulberg. Where does that leave us? In need of... Forward. My God, please give us a top. Jack Hughes. It's a, it's a forward-heavy draft. Pick a forward, please. Stan Olsen says, hey, guys, hope all is well. Had an idea that I thought I'd like to run by you guys. How about we uh, combine the All-Star Games and the Winter Classic so we only have to deal with one of those events per year instead of two? For prospects, I'm really not high on Doc at all. I think he's just going to end up being a game Velarde. I'm not sure if he's even a top-10 talent this year. I really like Cousins, Zegers, and Krebs more. But honestly, I think we're all sleeping on Alex Turcott. The dude's a tank that can skate like the wind and plays a 200-foot game. Elite playmaker with an underrated shot. If we end up picking outside the top two, my order for talent would be Pod Colson, Cousins, Turcotte, Krebs, Byram, Zegras, Boldy, and Kaliev. One defenseman I'm really high on is Victor Soderstrom. I think he's much closer to Bowen Byram level. I put him above Broberg, York, and Robertson. Thoughts? Thanks for all the hard work. Side note, I started watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine over a week ago. I'm halfway through Season 3. I've taken away that we need Captain Holt to be our next coach. We absolutely do. Yes, 100%. Um... Yeah, I, don't get me wrong. I like Kirby Doc. Kirby Doc's got my favorite attribute in a hockey player. Hockey IQ. He thinks the game at a very high level. 
Um, again, I think I talked about it last podcast. He does not play with pace. I have severe concerns about his ability to translate to the NHL and how much of his success in the WHL is just because he's bigger and stronger than a lot of his competition. That being said, with the style of game he plays, his best case scenario is Ryan Getzlaff. That's who he reminds me of. So I'm not going to sit here and say I don't think Kirby Doc can be a good NHL or he can be a tremendous NHL. I just, Turcotte, one of the guys you mentioned, I like. Um, I think I've got him up with Cousins and Doc on my list now. Peyton Krebs. I love Peyton Krebs. I've watched a bit more of his tape over the last few days. I, I think he needs to be right in there in that conversation with Cousins and Doc. Um, this, Like I said, once you get past three in this draft, I think it's wide open. I think the top three is pretty definitive. Hughes, Kako, Pud Colson at this point. And then there is honestly ten players in that next group that you could take at number four, realistically. Uh, Justin Klinsky says, about a month ago my heater went out again. So we had the head maintenance person and two other workers at my apartment. The head personnel saw all Tigers and Red Wings merch and, I, and asked if I'm de from Detroit. He also asked if Blashill was still a coach. I laughed and told him, unfortunately, yes. He then told me that Blashill's dad was his university professor. Anyways, it's cold outside and I can't wait to go on a lively walk. I also hate being sick. Thanks, Ryan. You're welcome. I'm feeling better. Uh, Jeffrey Carlton says, good morning, fellas. Uh, obviously, this is a Red Wings podcast, but can we talk about the Leafs for a sec? How hilarious is, it, hilarious is it to hear the Steve Dangle podcast getting so frustrated with Babs like we did sometimes? Do you think they'll succeed because of him or despite him? I think we all believe he's a great coach, but maybe not as great as everyone believes. Just a thought. Keep up the great podcast. I'm going to circle back to the same complaints I had about Babcock on this podcast when he was the coach. When it comes to systems and on-ice performance, I don't think there's a better coach in the game of hockey than Mike Babcock. He thinks that the game at an entirely different level than everybody else. When it comes to personnel decisions and who uh, to put on the ice at what time and with whom and who to put in the press box, he's one of the worst coaches in the NHL. Uh, <laughs> which is why I think Bla he's literally where I think Blashill gets a lot of his flaws uh, from as a coach in that just overly heavy on veterans and just values and tangibles way too much. He's one of the best coaches in hockey, but has drawbacks that you will never get away from. He, the team won't win despite him. He'll find success despite his drawbacks. If you, if it, like you're, you're talking net positives, like he's well in the green. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And I think one of the reasons Toronto is still successful with him is because Dubis has done such a good job of handcuffing them. No, sorry, you only have all these young pieces to play with. You have to play them in significant roles. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. The next question is from Rowan, who says, Greetings from the furnace that is down under. Mid-round drafting question. My theory is in round three and onwards is swing for high upside players. This doesn't seem to be something the Wings tend to do lately, apart from elite third-round pick Darren Helm, which now I think about it was almost 14 years ago. The last couple drafts I can recall a couple of guys that might have had a few issues but had flashes, and we seem to pass over them for someone safer. Last year, for example... Jake Wise, Semyon, Dare, Argu, Chintsev, and Alex Kovanov were all available to us, and Ostap Safin the year before. Maybe it's just an internal prospect bias of mine, and uh, Regula, Barton, and Eliason pan out, but better at least swing at one of them. I, I agree I completely. Uh, I disagree. Um, when you look at it, Seth Barton was one of those swings. He was an overager in a draft who was a late developer that was putting up some pretty respectable points in the BCHL, despite that being his first junior year at age 18. Like, he was a very late developer, and he's having a pretty strong season in the NCAA this year. So, uh, swinging for a goal, picking a goal in the mid-rounds is always a swing in Elias, and actually seems to be panning out pretty well so far. Athens C was a fourth-round pick. Nyquist was a fourth-round pick. I, I think Detroit takes some swings once they get outside of the second round. Yeah, they're going to take some defensive defensemen like Regula because every team drafts players like that. Man, Detroit drafted a kid who was 138 pounds in the last draft, but has skill for days. They are absolutely not afraid to take some swings and go off the board. They don't always pan out because only 10% of like third and fourth round picks ever actually pan out. So I've got no problems with the way they draft. I agree in that they should be you like you should be prioritizing the home run swings. Yeah, I um, agree. Because if you take if you look at percentages of a player and who ends up being an NHLer, like they're small. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not going to lose my mind over the Alec Regula pick, but... But, and even stuff, even picks with Regula, like, you can look at that from a certain perspective and consider that a swing, because you can watch a guy like that and go, man, he is, he's a pretty polished defenseman from a, on the defensive side of the puck, but he was playing behind Bouchard and a few other players. He never really got much offensive opportunity. Maybe when he gets some, there's something there. And I'm not saying Regula is the best example of this, but his points have upticked this year. And um, that's despite still playing behind Bouchard and Boakfist. So, that because if you get a guy who's polished on one side of the puck and there does happen to be some untapped offensive upside there too, you can hit big on picks like that. He also asked best and worst uh, jerseys in the Central, was it? Yeah, the Central. Best and worst jerseys in the Central Division? Best jersey has to... Oh, God, it's, it's Chicago. gross, but it's, it's Chicago. Yeah, it has to be Chicago. It's definitely Chicago. You know what? I don't hate the jerseys in the Central. I really I'm gonna, don't. I'm going to say... Dallas, maybe? I'm going to say the worst is Dallas. Not that I hate them. They're just... They're, they're average. They're forgettable. I don't like a slant. I don't like the italicized star. I don't really yeah. hate Because like, when you go through Minnesota, fantastic jerseys. Colorado, fantastic jerseys. Nashville, fantastic. Winnipeg's are good. They, they're. I'm still bitter about Winnipeg's because they could have done so much better, but they're still good. Winnipeg's are just like NHL. Like that's a default jersey if you create a new franchise in EA Sports NHL. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But the essential is actually pretty solid. It has to be. It just has to be Chicago. Yeah, it's a classic. Uh, we have time for a few questions from our Reddit thread. Um, Buffalo Soldier Eleven. I hope you noticed Evan hit a thousand followers. We did, and I'm sure Evan was uh, sorely disappointed as well. Um, Pricey D says, not really a question, but been listening to the podcast for the last three weeks and really enjoy it. Makes my daily drive a million times better. Thank you so much. Uh, that means the world to us. Um, if you know any other Red Wings fans who want to listen, let them know. Uh, I have a feeling the next six months will be huge for the future of the Wings. Ideally top two pick, new coach and GM. Worst case, we pick seven to eight and no major changes next year. Yeah, like the next, this is going to define a lot. I know we've been saying that, but like we truly are at um, a crossroads. Uh, we are going to get to the Ask WWP questions as well. Um, Yarvik7 says, it seems like forever since the Wings played hockey. There's a speed skating race between Jonathan Erickson, Thomas Vanek, and Thomas Holmstrom. Who wins? I think I commented already. Friction. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to give that, ah, boy, a light breeze. Holmstrom right now, maybe? <laughs> Or like if it's if it's Holmstrom right now, then definitely not him. But if it was Holmstrom in the day, this might be the one NHL question where I can actually honestly answer. Maybe me. <laughs> I might actually win that race. <laughs> um, we're gonna hop over to Twitter. Uh, Abe Azell says, "Just found out that Dino uh, Dino Cicerelli lives in my county and owns a restaurant just down the street." Here's hoping I bump into him soon. Have any of you guys run into NHLers anywhere you wouldn't have expected to? Uh, Adam Oates and Costco more than once. Um, in places that I wouldn't have expected? Um, no, but I've ran into family members. So my favorite story is there's a community center that's literally directly across the street from me. When election time rolls around, that's my voting center. So the one morning I woke up before work, I didn't feel like getting fully ready before going over, and so I just threw on some sweatpants and a Red Wings t-shirt. In the three minutes I was outside of my house, one person commented on my Red Wings t-shirt, asked if I was a big fan. This was about four years ago for reference. And I was talking. Turns out it was Todd Bertuzzi's aunt. And then as I'm leaving, um, an older couple uh, wearing King's hats um, stopped me and they go, nice shirt, but that should probably be LA. And after talking to them for a bit, that was Tanner Pearson's grandparents. Hmm. So that was the most random morning I've had. <laughs> Uh, Aros2911 or Woodson2 says chances Edmonton waits till the offseason to find the right GM and they take a run at Kenny. They uh, should wait till the offseason. I don't see them being that patient. Uh, I think they'll wait till the offseason. I think they, they should, should, but it's Edmonton. I have zero faith in them making the right decision. Uh, we have time for one more. And then, oh, God. It's got to be our friend OSBP. Uh, if you have a kid in the car, maybe turn the volume down. Uh, coming in hot, you dirty shits. You thought I was down and out, finished, dead, gone. You are wrong as Ferk. You can't kill what isn't alive, the lone, small, black, D. Uh, with the ad advent of the trapezoid and how effectively made good puck handling goalies less of a commodity, how did this affect Soviet and U.S. relations in the 21st century and beyond? 
My take, Putin installed a mole in the league office to single-handedly take down Brodeur as he was jealous of all the nookie Martin was slinging with family members. Started to listen to 31 Thoughts and holy shit, I just want Elliot Friedman to talk to me about hockey all day. When I become wealthy, I will poach him away from broadcasting with the sole intent of having him with me 100% of the time to tell me stories, hockey stories. At a big meeting, Elliot's there. Sneaking a dump at work, Elliot in the can. Bedtime, Elliot telling me Gretzky lullabies. Guy's a real gem. Happy New Year, you dirty furkheads. Don't forget who hated you guys first. We could never OSBP. Thank you for that poetry. <laughs> and with that, we're going to wrap up this week's episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. I'm going to tell it to you again. Twitter, at Winged Wheel Pod. Follow. Go to our bio. Our three accounts. Follow us. We love to engage with you guys. Thank you to all of our patrons. Um, all of you who support us, you guys are what make this show happen. We want to thank uh, our name level sponsors, our top level sponsors. Sean Levine, Chad Hiersack, Sky Carcass, Arjun Shanker, Clayton Van Dyken, Langabeer, Derek Shippert, Kalen Wood, Charlie Elkins, Stan Olson, Ryan Lewis, Dan Bell, Hannah Lee. Thank you guys so much. You want to support the show in other ways? Follow us however you get your podcasts. Hashtag do the thing on Spotify for the Wind Wheel Pod. Uh, on iTunes, rate us on iTunes. That's huge for us. Uh, and with that, we're going to go play some hockey. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wing Wheel Podcast. <laughs>